Hey, Connect Church, Pastor Derek here. I want to welcome you to our service today. I want to welcome, first of all, all our online viewers on our online campus, all those of you that are watching in a watch party right now at home. God bless you. And then in particular, I want to give a shout out to all the city groups, all the different locations, Natick, Framingham, Ashland, Marlboro, Milford. Way to go, guys. Glad that you're gathering there together in person. I pray a special blessing on all of your services today. So listen, we are in the continuation, the final installment in a series that we've entitled God's Ways. Last week, um, we talked about goalposts. This week, we're going to talk about signposts, signposts, seeing God's signs along the way. Okay, so before I get into today's services, um, I just want to just say, hey, those of you that are in a small group, way to go. If you have not had a chance to get into a small group, now is your chance. It's not too late. We have a bunch of online groups, and also we have a lot of in-person groups and even some hybrid meeting now. Don't miss a chance to do that. I'm sure there's somebody in the city groups that can help you and lead you and guide you and those online as well. Now, listen, I was thinking about how to start this message today. You know, um, I was thinking about, in a way, how I wake up um, Honestly, most days I wake up with a spring in my step. Like I'm, I'm not one of those guys that hits snooze over and over and over again. And so if you are one of those people, and it's not always this case, but if you just kind of get out of bed, you know, or going through life, just existing, you know, um, breathing air, um, sucking air, taking up space, sometimes I say, abusing God's grace. If that's you, God has so much more for you. There's more. And what if we could rise every day with, with purpose and, and intentionality and, and there was a lot of meaning in our life? What if when you went to bed at night, you're out of your lips before you kind of signed off consciously, you were saying, thank you, God, for what I get to do and thank you, God, for who I get to do it with. Pastor D, is that possible? I want you to know something. Absolutely, that is possible. I feel like I'm living on purpose, with a purpose, more than any other time in my life, and you can too. But how do we get there? Well, this series, in a word, has, been, has engulfed uh, this, 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 this term, discernment discernment. We get there because we need to learn how to uh, decide. We need to learn how to determine, to delineate, differentiate kind of all the different things that are going on in our life. And today, in particular, learn to see the signs, the cues, the clues that God has given us to figure out how to have that purpose-filled, intentional life. And so at the end of the series, we're here. This is the final installment on uh, discernment, but we're going to go to some additional uncharted territory, get a little bit uh, more narrowed in. So last week's message is really tied to this week. So quickly, let me review if you missed it. Last week's message was entitled Goalposts, and I kind of was playing off the Super Bowl, and if you imagined goalposts in a football field, um, you get down onto the field and a kicker, for example, will line up inside those goalposts. You and I, to begin the journey and discover the purpose and plan and will for our life, we have to get inside these two goalposts. One of them on the left is the providential will of God. This is God's will no matter what. This is what he's going to get done no matter what. Many are the purposes in a plan's heart, but it's the Lord's uh, purposes that prevail. So we need to line up with what he's going to do anyway. And then on the other side, we have the moral will of God. That's God's will according to scripture. And so we want to, in a sense, back up from the line, get inside that line of the moral will of God. As we come inside those two goalposts, in the middle is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the second half, good, that means God's will for you is good. It's not bad. He's not going to send you to a third world country, live in a mosquito, in a hut, being eaten alive by mosquitoes. No, God has a good uh, purpose for your life. You're going to be happy about it. Not only that, but it's pleasing. So that means it's going to do something that pleases the Lord. I think we should want to please God. And it says it's good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that means what it is for you specifically. The, the middle is God's specific will for your life. That's where we are zeroing in today. And so a little secret, again, 
You gotta align yourself with the providential, stay inside the more will of God, and then you begin to discover the purpose, the specific purpose for your life um, is in the middle of that. So now, there's these steps on this journey, on this path to discovering the specific will of God for your life. And, and how do we do that? How do we, how do we get um, the right directions, as it were, in this God's ways plan for my life, specifically, Pastor Derry? And so I want to illustrate that with a little bit of a story. This is a true story. I'm going back because I'm, I'm, I'm 50-something years old now. And um, I was in college at this time. No, I was out of college, actually, a, a little bit out of college. But my college buddy and I were traveling to a wedding for our best friend. Our friends Michael and Danelle Noonan were getting married. My wife was just with Danelle uh, just this last week. And so we were going from Oklahoma to Boulder, Colorado. And to get to the wedding, um, we were going to be like best men in the wedding, parts of the wedding. Uh, for Michael. To get to the wedding, uh, she gave us directions. Now back then, by the way, we didn't have, uh, you know, cell phones and, and, and texting, you know, back and forth to try to figure out what's the right direction. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have a Waze app. We didn't have a GPS system. We didn't have our car. None of that stuff, okay? So just throw that out of the story. Uh, it, it makes the story way more interesting. So as these neophyte navigators, we had to figure out with her directions how to get there. Well, right out of the gate, her directions were terrible. They had us going south instead of north, so we're on our way to Texas instead of Colorado, and if you know anything about geography, boys and girls, that was way off. We figured it out, praise the Lord, we got that pretty figured out. But as we're going, there's just so many crazy things that were happening as a result of Danelle's uh, directions. There was a lot of twists and turns and some funny experiences. In fact, I'll tell you one, and this is a little edgy, especially in today's world. Back then, it, it wasn't. And it has nothing to do with my message, but it's just kind of funny. And so we were... Um, we were going to Colorado, I remember going through, or coming up to a toll booth, and we see this, uh, this, this young girl on the side of the road looking like she needs a ride, pretty Asian girl, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And um, Paul's like, pull over. I'm like, no, no, and he's like, pull over. Of course, Paul's single, so he's like, maybe we can give her a ride, <laughs> you know? And so um, he pulls over, she comes up to her window, and bottom line is she speaks little or no English. She's She's, she's speaking like a little bit of Chinese, we think, and we don't understand it. But we were able to, with motions and smiles, to say, hey, yeah, we'll give you a lift to the next exit, and then we can drop you off. So she jumps in the car, and as fast as she jumps in the car, and Paul's excited, um, another guy jumps in the car. Well, apparently it's her father. <laughs> so that kind of ruined the experience for Paul. And anyway, we are traveling with them, and we're unable to communicate, like communication of no avail. Just smiling at each other back and forth, a lot of ignored uh, attempts ultimately. And so we just determined to take her to the next exit and her father and drop them off. And then all of a sudden, before we get there, they start fighting. And they're fighting loud and they're talking in Chinese, I think. They're talking in Chinese and it was crazy. And I, I'm embarrassed to demonstrate, but I said, like, you know, I don't know. I, I, it, was, it was nutty. And so we were like, are you guys okay? And they're not replying. And and it was get and it was getting softer to to a little bit louder to a little bit. And before you know, it's really loud. They're fighting really bad. And so Paul, he's a comedian. It's probably not funny now, but it was funny then. So please give me a little slack on the line. He starts imitating them softly in the front of the seat. And I'm like, Paul, no, you shouldn't be doing that. And then they get louder. So he decides to get a little bit louder. And I'm 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 laughing at him. I'm like, I can't even believe you're doing this right now. And they're louder. He's louder. And going back and forth. It was just absolutely hysterical. And I'm pretty sure they could hear him. And so. Anyway, we get to the next exit. I'm not trying to offend anybody. It's just, this is just how it went down. We get to the next exit, and the, the Asian girl's like, you know, hit the window and, so, like, stop. And so we stop. We let her out. She gets out of the car. The father gets out of the car. Paul's sad because she's leaving because she's really pretty and says goodbye. And she kind of waves, like, without even looking back. And then we're about to drive off. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the old man knocks on the window. Paul rolls down the window. And he's like... Hey guys, just want to thank you for the ride. What? You speak English? What? And we were just like totally befuddled, if that's a word, you know, that we felt like idiots, you know, Paul's making fun of them and they spoke English the whole time. Oh boy. So anyway, back to the story. That's just for fun. And we go off to Colorado and as we get into 
not only Colorado, but we get into the town of which she lives. We're not just in the state, we're in the town. We're in Boulder, Colorado, and all of a sudden the directions, woo, they unravel really bad. So again, we're in the right state. Think of this in terms of concentric circles. We're in the right town, but we need to get to the right address and the directions spin out of control. And some of you are in that place in your life right now. You're inside the providential will of God. You're living inside the moral will of God to the best of your ability, but you just can't seem to get to the right address, to your destiny, to your personal plan from God, your purpose from God. This is very relevant. Back to the story. So it's 2 a.m. We're in Boulder, Colorado. We can't call anyone, and there were no cell phones or text messaging at the time anyway. And so we look at Danelle's directions and wondered, how do we miss it? Like, we followed them to a T, we think, and we're so close yet so far away. You know, like the old song, so far away. You probably don't know that song. Anyway, we couldn't ask for help. Gas stations are closed. Our own logic has run out, and we check the map over and over and over again. We start nipping at each other, getting frustrated with each other. We're just lost. We're just lost. We're lost, in a sense, in the middle. And some people can feel that way when they're doing this part right and that part right, but still feel lost in the middle. And so Paul and I felt a little bit hopeless. We have a, a wedding rehearsal the next morning at 9 a.m. It's like 2, 3 in the morning now. Are we going to get any sleep? Are we going to find it? Will we, will we even be able to make it? We were in the area, but the specifics were eluding us, and it seemed the directions were wrong. So what did I do? I said, Paul, I don't know. I just stopped and just said, God, please help us. Lord, we don't, I don't know where I am. I don't know where to go. I don't know what my next step is. Give me wisdom that I don't have. I just, I don't remember all the specifics, but I asked God for help. I asked him for witness. And in that moment of request, I got, I got like a, I got this like gut feeling. A lot of times people, when they describe the Holy Spirit's movings, we, sometimes they have a, a more modern or primitive way of describing it. It's kind of a gut feeling. I got a gut feeling that we should start over, that we should go to the place where we had it right at last. And, and so we decided to return to the last place we recognized where things kind of all went wrong and began to unravel. And we got there, and I looked at the sign, and it was matching the directions, and the directions were matching the sign. And, and, and this time, though, I looked again. I looked a little bit more. And I'm looking up. It's one of those signposts, you know, the little green signs at the top of the post. And on the top of the post is a piece of paper. And it's flapping in the wind. And now this is three in the morning. It's raining. It's windy. This thing's flapping in the wind. And I'm like, is that duct tape connected to that piece of paper up there flapping around? Paul, do you see that? He's like, yeah, I see that. I said, Oh my gosh, what is that? He goes, I don't know, let's go, let's go look at it. So we get over there, it's a pretty high post. So Paul climbs on my, actually I bent over, Paul steps on my back, he shimmies up the pole, he gets the piece of paper, he, he pulls it down, he goes, oh my gosh, look at this. These are directions. <laughs> it's from Danelle. <coughs> Danelle's the girl we're going to see. It was instructions from Danelle on the top of the signpost where the directions last matched. Now, she knew she even put this in her notes, in the directions, excuse me. <clears throat> she said, I knew the directions were a little bit off. You think, you think, Danelle? And so she left certain speci specifics to get, for us to get to her house safely. And we couldn't believe it. And we gained, as it were, more certainty as we went forward as a result of that experience. So she knew the directions were a bit off. You think, Danelle? Yeah, I think so. And so she knew that she, if she didn't give a little more specifics, we wouldn't find the house safely. We couldn't believe it though. We were like, wow. And so we began to gain a little bit more confidence because of what we uh, received. And we had a little more certainty along the way. And as we went from signpost to signpost now, we kept following, we kept finding these little cues and these little notes from Danelle. And along the way, we would meet resistance because the wind might have blown one sign away. And we had to go find it in the bushes. And, and, and another time, it was a little bit more difficult than the last time. And, but we still were confident like this. There were directions there for us. And we would eventually, we would eventually find her house. Several signposts later, we found our destination. We found uh, 
Danelle's home. And we became more certain that this, is, this was all in the plan. The signposts that were, the signs on the signposts ultimately saved the day for all of us. Now, God has, for you and me, similar signposts on your journey to the personal will of God for your life. And what I'd like to do is, if you're, if you're interested, if you're trying to find that, I want you to know that in God's word, he gives us four fundamental signposts to help us narrow in, get that, that, that specific, discern those specifics from God. These four signposts are almost always there on your path to the purpose of God. Now, our key text is Acts chapter 20, and the Apostle Paul is kind of, uh, he's having like a little farewell message to some elders as he's there in Ephesus. And he reveals these four signposts in the scripture in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 and following. That's our key text. Now, these signposts show up all over the Bible. They show up in a lot of different characters in scripture, like Nehemiah and Moses and John the Baptist. But this one's really cool from Acts chapter 20. Look at it with me in your notes. Acts 20, 22 says this. And now, compelled by the Spirit... Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task, the purpose of God, of testifying to the gospel of grace. So I want to give you four signposts from this text of discerning the personal will of God. Number one, the Spirit's promptings. That's your fill in the bank. Blank. The Spirit's promptings. This is the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, it says, and now compelled by the Spirit. That word compelled, the New Testament is written in Greek, and in the Greek that word is the word deo honuma. Deo honuma. Now, deo basically means compelled by the Spirit. Deo means it's like, um, it's like you're bound, you're, you're strapped with cords, you're, you're, you're almost like being lassoed and, and tied and pulled to something. Deo honuma. Now, numa is the spirit part. It's the breath of God. It's, the, it's like a current of air. It's like a breeze. And so it's like, it's like blowing you in a certain direction, you could say. How do I explain this better? I don't really know. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christ follower, if you've never made Jesus your sin bearer, it's, this is really hard because the Bible says in Acts, there's like a veil that's over your eyes. It's hard for you to see. It's like, ah, this is, this is you know, gobbledygush. I don't, I don't know that I believe this. But as a Christian, a, a, there's sometimes natural parallels to spiritual parallels. Um, it would be like you going to the mall. Now, a lot of us haven't been in the mall that much during the pandemic, but at, at, some of you have. But you probably remember at a certain point in time going to the mall when it's full and all the, the little stores are open. But there's one store that would always kind of compel you in, right? You, you get into the mall and you, you, start, you start smelling something really, really good. You know that it, you shouldn't have it, but your flesh is like, yeah, I want that. What is it? It's Aunt Annie, Auntie Annie's pretzels or those like, or those like cinnamon buns, or I think is what it is. And, and it gets on you and you don't even know where it is in the mall. You, don't, you, don't, you didn't know the legend and you didn't look at that. You're just, you're just drawn to it. That's that feeling where you're like being drawn to a cinnamon roll from heaven. That feeling is what it means to be compelled by the Spirit. Deo hunuma. It's when God kind of wraps you up and this breeze kind of pulls you in. It's, it's, it's when a person is pregnant with vision and, and God is drawing you. The Bible says that the, the Father draws and, and, and each step of faith that you take, it gets stronger. And, and, and people sometimes say, I have a gut feeling. But as Christians, we believe it's the Spirit's promptings. We believe it's Deo Honuma. And there is something in you that is telling you, go here or go there or do this or do that. That is what it means to be compelled by the Spirit. A great example, uh, other than the one I've given you, is Job 32. Look in your notes, Job 32, 18 says, For I am full of words, and the spirit within me compels me. Inside I am like a bottled up wine, like new wineskins ready to burst. So like if I had two Cokes right here on the table, one I just left there, and the other one I just shook up. 
And I just kept shaking it and shaking it and shaking it. And we're just standing next to each other. And I'm just shaking away and shaking away. And then all of a sudden, I look like I'm going to crack that. What are you going to do? You're going to run for the hills because you know that baby's been bottled up and something's about to kind of burst out of it. That's, that's another, this word compels, it's, it's you're shaking up. You're, 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 you're bursting with vision. You're, you're, you're bursting out with what God has inside of you. He's compelled you. And, and, and you're saying, well, I don't ever get that feeling. And that never happens to me. And, 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 and you know, I don't, I don't know what, what you're talking about. And that day of Hunuma is not really an experience that I have. And I would say, well, let God shake you up then. Maybe God needs to shake you up. Maybe you're, you're, you're not being drawn in the right direction because you're not spending enough time with him in his presence. You're not spending time in the word of God. Maybe you need to be worshiping God more instead of worshiping other things to get you out of that complacency and out of that silence, as it were, and, and let, so that God begins to prompt you again. Maybe you should fast and overnourish your spirit and so that your, your sense of hearing becomes more acute for the spirit of God. Maybe you should give as, 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 a, as almost like a spot sponsor of, of change in your heart, a catalyst for change in your heart. It begins to shake you up. Maybe you begin to minister to someone and get outside of yourself, and then God begins to put other things on your heart about them as a result supernaturally. You, you need to let God shake you up. Are you with me out there in the chat? Are you with me there in the city groups? Let God shake you up again. And let me tell you this. As I said last week, and this is kind of tied into this week, it's more common than uncommon to experience Deho Numa, it's more common than uncommon to experience the compellings of the Spirit when you're walking in the providential, lined up with the providential will of God. That's what God's going to do on the earth through his church, for example, the bride, uh, that what he wants to do to share the gospel with the whole world. And it's more common and possible when you also are lining up and living inside the moral will of God as well. So the first signpost... Finding the specific will of God is the Spirit's promptings. Number two, write this down. The second signpost on your journey is what's called certain uncertainty. Certain uncertainty. I guarantee that there will be a moment when you are wondering as you begin to move forward on this journey, did I miss it? Did I miss it? Am I, did, was that, was that God or was that just a, you know, spirit, or was that just a bad taco that I ate last night? Perhaps you know that God, or you think that God has called you in a certain direction. You take a step of faith, you begin to move out, and in that, you'll always have a certain uncertainty. That's why it requires faith, everybody. Faith. Paul says in verse 22, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. He's like, I know God called me, but I don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. There's always going to be a certain uncertainty when you step out in faith. That's why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, parentheses, yet, close parentheses, okay? So he knew God prompted him, that's all, and that's normal. That's normal in the discovery of your final destination in the will of God. I can remember when Years ago, when my youngest daughter, Morgan, we call her Momo, Blueberry, because she's got these beautiful blue eyes, when Morgan was just a little kid, she was like five or six years old, we, as a family, we would always go to the beach every summer, we still do, and we went to, I think it's Saco, Maine, water country, water country, all right, you guys are all saying it right now, have some fun, okay. Um, <laughs> some of you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay, but we went to water country, and um, they have all these crazy water slides. And I knew that if I asked Morgan, do you want to go on a water slide with daddy, a big one, she'd say no. So I still asked her and she's like, no, daddy, that's okay. And I'm like, no, come on, you're going to go. No, I don't want to. And so she's five years old. I'm like, come on, come with me. Daddy will carry you. And she's all reluctant and squirming. Like, no, daddy, no, I don't want to, daddy, no. And she's whining, whining, whining. And I take her to the top of this big water slide. And you're probably like, you are one cruel parent. We never let our kids get away with like being afraid of stuff. So taking her to the top of this water slide and she's like on me like a koala bear on a koala tree. Like, you know, we get to the top and she's, she's really, really nervous now. And daddy, I don't want to, please no, daddy, please don't daddy. Woo! We go down, I'm screaming, she's screaming in a different way. We get to the bottom, you know, we, we stand up, I put her down on her feet and she goes, again, daddy, again. <laughs> I was like, ah, Morgan, so predictable. I knew you were freaking going to love it. And so when we left the water slide, she nearly cried because we had to leave 
the water slide. She was going down face first by the end. It was crazy. And so on the other side of that experience, she had to put her faith in her father. She had to learn to trust that her father knew what was best for her, knew what she was capable of doing. And, and, and if she had known on the front end, if she had been left to her own devices, in a sense, uh, she, wouldn't have, she wouldn't have experienced that until she tried it, until she tried it. And the truth is, God is going to call you to some things, and he's going to call you to do some things that if you knew the details, details, you wouldn't do it. I'm not saying there's not some due diligence on a high level, but a lot of times we, we want more than we need. And so on this signpost, Paul says this. He says, I know he called me to Jerusalem, a city. But he didn't know much more than that. I don't know what will happen to me there. I don't know what's going to happen. And there are those of you that are like wanting God to just be, just be like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, all the way through the alphabet. And even when you get to the end of that, you wouldn't do it. Some of you know the next step for you is marry the girl. You've been with her for 17 years. Okay? It's like, oh, it's time. It's time to make that decision to go forward. You have the clues that you need. God is, God is basically saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. Some of you, you, you know, you, 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 you want to have children, and, and you're never going to be totally ready for those things. Obviously, there's a due diligence. There's a certain preparation and maturity that's needed. Some of you need to move to another city, take another job, join a church, all right? What happens is, you're, if you just wait for the details, nothing's going to happen. We are consciously or unconsciously, often with God saying, God, give me the total plan. Download the details to me. And God is like, no, you couldn't handle the truth. You're on a need-to-know basis. Those details will overwhelm you, and I'm here to protect you. So he created you to be dependent on him, to be uh, what we call a, a spirit of poverty, a divine poverty where you know and you trust God completely. Amen. So some of you are there right now. You've like pulled offshore. You know you, you're, there's a certain direction that you're pointed in. Um, but you're looking forward and you're looking backward at the same time. You are here and you are there at the same time. You're in this certain uncertainty. I want to show you another place in Scripture where this whole thing shows up, and, and, um, and I think it helps you in your life personally. 1 Corinthians 16, 5 says, After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Look what he says. He says, Perhaps I'll stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I don't want to see you now and make only a passive visit. I hope to spend time with you, if the Lord permits. See, these are all words of uncertainty. They're indicators of certain uncertainty. But I will stay at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me. So he knows God's called him to something. And there are many who oppose me. Now, this is where the tides shift. So I want to go to a new signpost. So signpost number one, spirit's prompting. Signpost number two, certain uncertainty. Now this one's the tough one. Signpost number three, predictable resistance. There are certain people who will oppose me, he said in 1 Corinthians. Predictable resistance. You can put this on your calendar. You can put it on your iPhone, your Blackberry, your Crackberry, your Strawberry, whatever it is you use to mark things down, you will face predictable resistance when you are on the path and plan of God. Christians, you can be sure of this. Moses, who is prompted by the Spirit to uh, help his people who were being oppressed in slavery, uh, he faced a lot of certain uncertainty. He ultimately faced a predictable resistance from the Pharaoh, the king of the, uh, of the most powerful nation in the world at that particular time. And his certain uncertainty was, uh, you know, I can't speak, you know, I'm not good enough, uh, uh, can somebody else do it? And, and then he comes up against the Pharaoh. And, he, and, and, and you know all the story. Eventually he faces the, the, his back to the Red Sea and he's looking at his people and he's like, he has this moment of uncommon clarity. He's like, God, I know you called me to this, and what, here I am facing a wall. Here I am facing resistance, the Red Sea. How many know that's some resistance, everybody? And then he puts his staff down, and it parts the seas, and they cross on dry land. See, Nehemiah, he faced uh, Sanballat and, and Tobiah. They were, they were resistors, and they plotted against them. John the Baptist faced resistance at being kind of the forerunner to prepare the way of Jesus Christ, and ultimately he was arrested. Ultimately he was imprisoned, even, even beheaded the ultimate resistance. 
You better be sure that when you're trying to do the will and purpose and plan of God, there will be resistance. Not like that in Jesus' name. But Acts 20, 23, look what it says. God, back to our key text, God has prompted him. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardships are facing me. Predictable resistance. So in the hard times, Derek, are we still in the will of God? Yes, absolutely, because it's one of the four signposts. You will always, always, always face predictable risk resistance. This is not fun to preach. This is not fun to experience. It's just, it's in the Bible. It's in the Christian experience. The Holy Spirit warned him, and the Holy Spirit will warn us as well. But God will always take you through it. God will always be with you through it. And it's really something we have to embrace. It's kind of like in the gym, we have the no pain, no gain concept. But in the kingdom, we have K-N-O-W pain, K-N-O-W gain. We have to embrace that this is part of the process. One of my mentors uh, in the early years of my Christian experience in ministry, particularly and also in marriage, he married me. His name was Bruce Terry. He said, he said Derek, um, before you get into ministry, I, I know you're getting right, you, I was being a, a, appointed as a pastor, ordained as a pastor. He said, I have a word for you. And I was so excited. I was like, my mentor is going to bring a word. It's going to be one of them prayer Jabez. You know, I'm going to enlarge your territory. You know, he's going to pray Ephesians 3.20. You're going to do above and beyond all that you can ask or think, more than you can even imagine or expect. No, he didn't do that. No, he said, Derek, my word from the Lord for, for you is this. You will be broken. Um, survey says, eh, eh. <laughs> can we have another word? I was like, no, I didn't really like that word. And I can tell you right now that there's probably been no word more true, more, more uh, relevant to me than that word. It, it, things might look like always great on the outside. You know, you see the, you see the, you see the polish and you see the you know, you know, maybe to you everything looks like it's great, but every year a new challenge, every year a new problem, every year a little bit more of me and, and, and me and Stace and, our, and different things that are in our family has had to die. To, you know, this journey has been arduous. Has it had ups? Oh, tons. Is it, has it had victories? Amazing. Mountaintop experiences, no doubt. But it's had a lot of valleys. It's had a lot of difficult places and spaces. And the resistance that we have faced being in ministry never stops. Right now, as I sit here right now, there's so much resistance to the purpose and plan of God for me, for me and the leading of this church. There always is and always will be because it's more about God's agenda than mine and you'll, you'll be broken. Is it worth it? Yeah. I had this quote um, I put uh, in my phone and, and I, I wrote it like this. It's sometimes hard to do a good thing, but it's easy to do a bad thing. Isn't that true? It's hard to do a good thing, but it's easy to do a bad thing. But here's the thing. Easy is never worth it, and harder always is. That's the truth. If it's easy, it's never worth it, but harder always is. So if you take a step forward, don't be surprised if you're pushed, if you're pushed back. If you catch vision, maybe for a uh, financial uh, breakthrough, a provision, a, a, a business plan or something like that, expect a, a, a financial challenge to come right around the corner. If you commit to really love your wife like Christ loved the church or your husband and respect him and admire him and you want to have a, a marriage that's a trophy before God, expect a fight that night because there will be predictable resistance. You know, God, God doesn't build faith on the mountains on the mountaintops. He builds our faith in the valleys. Any faith that isn't tested can't be trusted, I've always said. And so God is with you, though, in those valleys. And if you're in a valley right now, between the moral will of God and the providential will of God, that's a valley. That's, that, that's, that's, there's a difference between you know, being in sin and, and, and being in suffering. And so, but in that place, the Bible tells us in Psalm 23, 4, it says, even though I walk through the valley, of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for thou art with me. When you're going through hell, everybody, don't stop. You know that, that song, you know, not today, Satan, not today. That should be our confession when we're in those valleys and we confess our way back up onto those mountaintops. So the first signpost is the Spirit's promptings. The second is certain uncertainty. The third is predictable resistance. And finally, everybody say, finally. Say it like you're happy that I'm still preaching. Finally in the chat. Come on, everybody in the city group, say, finally. Final point is, number four, uncommon clarity. Uncommon clarity. This is where it gets really fun in this 
personal will of God for your life. This is the moment when the Spirit is drawing you. You know it. You have a confidence. There's an uncommon clarity. This is where it's like I'm right in the middle of the will of God, an aha moment, you know, and, 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 and you're, you're following him. And then you face some resistance, you know, you know, like you get that compelling. Then you face some resistance and, 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 and you go through that. But after that, it's like at this point things crystallize. And it's like, okay, that makes sense why that happened and that was God. And that makes sense that, that uncertainty that I had, but now I see that differently. And of course, there's going to be predictable resistance, but bam, now I can see. I can see clearly now the rain is gone, right? Like the song, right? And I know and as a result, I'm obedient in this moment. And in this place, I've got the picture, of the, the big picture, what God's trying to do in and through me. And you see all the little things in their proper perspective and everything. Yeah, that's what happens. You know, in, in 2020, the beginning of the year, I was like, vision, multiply, rah, COVID, boom, body slam, spiritually, <laughs> you know? And, and so what happened was I was compelled by the Spirit. What happened was I had a little bit of certain uncertainty. What happened for the last 11 months, I had some predictable resistance. But I can tell you as I sit here right now, I have this, you know, uncommon clarity that we are on right, the right track. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm getting all those city groups, I hope, fired up right now. We have an uncommon clarity that God is going to do something mighty through our church, that we are going to multiply. We're going to see campuses launched and new locations. We're building leaders. We're getting better all at the same time, and God is working in our midst. But we had to see this process come to pass. We have to go through these different signposts in our life. Verse 24 says this, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If I only may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul is saying, and we should be too, you know what? My life doesn't matter because I know his plan. I know his, I, I can see the picture. I, the hardships don't matter because I know the big picture. And, 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 and I get there according to, to, to his plan and not my plan. And, and as Paul says somewhere else, these light and momentary troubles, they are achieving me, for me a glory that far outweighs them all. He's saying these things along the way that I face, bugs on the windshield swipe them off. I've got vision. I know where I'm going. I'm not living in the rear view mirror anymore. I'm not looking back. I'm looking forward. I have this uncommon clarity. Paul says, I don't know or need to know the details because I have an uncommon clarity about the big picture of what God wants to do. Jesus was that way when he was on the earth. Did you realize that? He was... He was very precise. He used this one word that pops with me in John 14, 31. You can look it up on your own. He says, I want the world to know that I love the Father relationship. And I do exactly what he's telling me to do. So see, he was, he was completely committed to the specific plan that God had for him. And he was following that mission to AT. This is one of the greatest blessings in my life personally right now. It really kind of holds me together. It binds me together. It helps me through the difficult times because I know without a shadow of a doubt that, that I, I know what I'm called to do. My focus as a result is sharper, you know, and, and intense. And because of that uncommon clarity that he has given me. And so I can shake off things a little bit easier. I want you to know, it, God wants to shake you up, some of you, because you're not living inside those boundaries and because you're not doing the things that will stir the Deo Hinuma, Honuma in your life. But for some of you, it's not just shake up. Some of you, God, when you do what he's called you to do, you can shake off some of those things. And, and because you're following that precise path and you have passion while you're doing it, and those things don't distract you. Nehemiah figured this out. Nehemiah saw the big picture. God wanted him to rebuild the broken walls. And so he had these people that were trying to sabotage the plan of God and call him down from the wall. And he says, no, I can't come down from there because I'm doing, I'm doing a mighty work. He didn't know what they were going to try to do to him, but because they, they were trying to they had a plot to destroy him and take him out, but he would not. He, here's what he said. He said in verse 3 of Nehemiah 6, he said, so I sent messages to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? See, you're doing a great work, some of you. I'm doing a great work, I know that. Why should I come down and be distracted 
by the, the foolish things of this world. Uh, he, he, Nehemiah, had an uncommon clarity because of this picture that he saw, this vision that he had for his life. What, a, what could have been a huge distraction, maybe even taking him out if he didn't have that vision. But he did, and it protected him. Listen, your purpose protects. You might want to write that in the notes. You might want to make a tattoo. Purpose protects. Did he just say get a tattoo? No, I did not say that. Stop that. All right. He was focused because he had a crystal clear vision for his life. So my life, as, as, I, as, I, as I walk these signposts, becomes more and more clear to me. My mission is to build a local church with a regional impact, to connect the disconnected to God. Each one reach one. Maybe it's somebody that you know. Maybe it's somebody new. We want to see people grow and gather. We want to see people, uh, you know, engaged in the body of Christ. We want to see people serving other people and, 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 and reaching other people. And so my mission is to have a, a marriage that reflects the, the, the union that God has with his church. And I want it to be a model and my family to be a model. And so because of that vision, there's only a few things that I can do and do well. Other things, they're just a distraction. So I can't come down from the wall. Back in the day when people would ask me, can you play ball Sunday mornings? No, I can't play ball on a Sunday morning because I've got, I'm, I'm building the wall. I, I've got a, a work that God's called me to do. And some of you used to send your kids all over God's green earth, you know, when, when they might, maybe should have been in a youth group or they should have been in church on a Sunday morning. And think, look at where we've gone because we don't have vision for our life, everybody. You can get distracted. But when you have vision, those distractions, lose their power how many potential dangers how many regrets could be avoided if we were living with vision how many times would we might be you know if we had vision uh, for our finances that God gave us might we be debt free now how many how many different things with our temple if we had vision we'd say no to the happy meals come on somebody and so when you have a big picture for your life, a specific plan and vision for your life, then all those distractions fall away. My final thought, write this down, is this. This is huge. This is, this is what I'm trying to say in encapsulated form. When vision increases, options decrease, making it easier to discern the personal will of God for your life. When vision increases, options decrease, making it clear to discern the personal will of God for your life. The train's coming, that means the Holy Ghost is coming, that means we're supposed to be wrapping up. So how do you know you're on the right road? You have Deo Honuma. You have those compellings of the Spirit. You have certain uncertain. You might not know everything, but you know God has called you. And you know there's going to be those moments where it's like, hmm, but you know God called you. And then you face predictable resistance. You know there's going to be opposition. In fact, that resistance is confirmation that you are on the path and track of God. And then ultimately what happens is things begin to crystallize. You have this uncommon clarity. You know that you know that you know that He's in this. You you're doing what he's created you to do. And as vision increases, options decrease, giving you better and better discernment over the personal will of God for your life. I hope this helps you. That's my goal as your pastor is to help you find purpose for your life. It's one of the most important questions you can answer. It's why you're on this planet. And so pursue him. Get after this. Make this a part of your devotion and don't, don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity to grow. Don't miss this opportunity to make a big difference in the world today. Can I have an amen in the chat? Can I have a big amen in all the city groups right out loud? Come on, somebody. Listen, I want to pray for two groups of people as we finish up today's services today. I want to say there's some of you out there online listen you know on Facebook maybe you're in the city group today are you facing resistance today are you facing resistance maybe you're facing resistance today I was just thinking this because you're you're not submitted to God and so you can't resist the devil but maybe you're inside the goalposts of God the moral will and the providential will and you're experiencing resistance I want to pray you through that right now so with every head bowed, wherever you are, every eye closed, let me pray for that group. Lord, I just, right now, I just come before you on their behalf. Lord, lead them. May your voice be abundantly clear. May the compellings of the Spirit, the volume be turned up in Jesus' name. May you give them courage through that certain uncertainty, Lord. 
And Lord, in this phase of resistance, Lord, help them to get that breakthrough in Jesus' name. Breakthrough maybe in their finances. Breakthrough in their marriage because, God, you've called them to have a better marriage. You've called them to have, Lord, blessings so they could be a blessing, Lord. Breakthrough in their ministries, Lord. There's some kind of lid there and they're just not able to grow and, and see it multiply. Lord, give them breakthrough through that resistance in Jesus' name. And I pray for an uncommon clarity, Lord, that you give them vision that they haven't even had up until this point right now. Give them that aha moment in Jesus' name. And maybe you're there and you're, you're, not, uh, you're not inside, you're outside. You're outside the providential will. You're outside of the moral will of God. And you can't have a spirit prompting until you've invited Jesus to come into your life and actually quicken your spirit. See, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died to pay for your sins and that he rose on the third day to give you a new life, to, make you, to give you a new identity, to no longer walk around with a fake ID, live in somebody else's life, but live the life that God has called you to lead. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you're saved. And when you're saved, then he'll begin to take you on a journey. If that's you today and you've never done that, man, it's my honor to be able to invite you. And so if you want that, if you're in a city group, um, I'm just going to ask all the city group leaders to come up right now. Just come to the front because I want to be there to pray for people at the end of the service today. And if you're online, if you're on a Facebook, uh, uh, on the Facebook platform, or if you're in a, um, what do you call them, the, uh, the watch party, if you're there, I just want you to just raise your hand as a sign to, to God. If you're on the online campus, there's a little thing there. You can raise your hand. If you're in a city group, just raise your hand. That's me. I want to give my life with every head bowed. So you can just honor those people. I want to give my life. I want to come into relationship with Jesus Christ right now. If that's you, just raise your hand. All right. Now you can put it down. I want to pray with you. And would all of you join with them as they pray, just so that you can come alongside them. But those of you, you know who you are. Pray this out loud from your heart. Say, Jesus, today I give my life to you. Today I fully surrender. Today I confess that I can't do it without you. Today, I believe that you did it for me. I receive by grace, through faith, salvation. Now, Father, for every person who prayed that prayer, seal it unto the day of redemption. Your word says that. Seal it, Lord, to the day you call us home. And I pray now that, Lord, their spirit comes alive. Their mind and their body were alive, but now their spirit's alive because they have professed Jesus. And the Holy Spirit now it just regenerates that spirit part of them. They're alive, and now they can get the spirit's promptings. Now they can begin to walk that supernatural journey, finding the specific plan of God for their life. Lord, give them all purpose. May they live on purpose, and may they change lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now listen, if you made that decision, I want you to text somebody. If, if, you're, if you're online, and if you're in a city group, tell somebody. Text to CC Saved to 97,000. And when you do, CC Save to 97,000, we're gonna send you a book and we're gonna help you on your journey. And the book's called What's Next. So you'll know exactly what to do, what needs to happen next. For some of you that are in a city group, hey, don't leave church today. First of all, without connecting with somebody, but more importantly, don't leave with a need that you haven't been prayed for. We're here to pray for you because we believe prayer changes things. And so those leaders are up front. They won't lay hands on you, but they'll lay hands near you. And we believe God's gonna do a mighty work. I can't wait to see you in church or city group nearby or small group. So many of you are in small groups, get in one. Don't miss that chance. God loves you, I love you, and I'll see you next week. God bless.